Do we look for intent or do we only see a rule? When Christ healed on the Sabbath, the religious leaders, the experts in the law, saw the rule broken, not the glory of God through the healing done. So when Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Does that rule out all women making, or any woman making a comment at a Bible study or having a part in a discussion with men present? Can she counsel or teach her children in the presence of her husband? Am I disobeying the rule by doing this video? When Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verses 3 to 5, Let not yours be the external adorning of braided hair and putting on of gold. Is that a rule against braided hair and gold jewelry? These questions are addressed by John Piper and Wayne Grudem in the section of the second chapter in Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. So I wanted to read their responses to you. Uh, the first one, I'll read you the question and, and the response. The first one is, Are you saying that it is all right for women to teach men under some circumstances? They, he says, when Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. We do not understand him to mean an absolute prohibition of all teaching by women. Paul instructs the older women to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women. And he uh, commends the teaching that Eunice and Lois gave to their son and grandson, Timothy. Proverbs praises the ideal wife because she speaks with wisdom, and faithfully instruction is on her tongue. Paul endorses women prophesying in the church and says that men learn by such prophesying and that the members, presumably men and women, should teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Then, of course, there is Priscilla and Aquila's side correcting Apollos. It is arbitrary to think that Paul had every form of teaching in mind in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Teaching and learning are such broad terms that it is impossible that women not teach men and men not learn from women in some sense. There is a way that nature teaches uh, then he says, and a fig tree teaches, and the suffering teaches, and suffering teaches, and human behavior teaches. If Paul did not have every conceivable form of teaching and learning in mind, what did he mean? Along with the fact that the setting here is the church assembled for prayer and teaching, the best clue is the count is the coupling of teaching with having authority over men we would say that the teaching inappropriate for women is the teaching of men in settings or ways that dishonor the calling of men to bear the primary responsibility for teaching and leadership the second question about braided hair uh, is here. I just want to make sure I'm reading the right one. Question 31. Aren't you guilty of a selective literalism when you say some commands in a text are permanent 
uh, permanently valid and others like don't wear braided hair or do wear a head covering are culturally conditioned and not absolute. So their response here is all of life and language is culturally conditioned. We share with all interpreters the challenge of discerning how biblical teaching should be applied today in a very different culture. In demonstrating the permanent validity of a command, we would try to show from its context that it has roots in the nature of God, the gospel, or creation as God ordered it. We would study these things as they are unfolded throughout Scripture. In contrast, to show that the specific forms of some commands are limited to one kind of situation or culture. 1. We seek for clues in the context that this is so. 2. We compare other scriptures relating to the same subject to see if we are dealing with limited application or with an abiding requirement. And 3. We try to show that the culturally specific, specific, specificity, specificness, I guess, um, of the command is not rooted in the nature of God, the gospel, or the created order. In, contra- text, in context of Paul's and Peter's teaching, about how men and women relate in the church and the home. There are instructions not only about submission and leadership, but also about forms of feminine adornment. Here are relevant verses with our literal translation. So then he he has 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 and 10. Likewise, the women are to adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and sensibleness, not in braids and gold or pearls or expensive clothing, but as is fitting for women who profess godliness through good works. And 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 5, Let not yours be the external adorning of braided hair, and putting on of gold or wearing clothes, but the hidden person of the heart, by the imperishable jewel of a meek and quiet spirit, which is precious before God. It would be wrong to say that these commands are not relevant today. One clear abiding teaching in them is that the focus of effort at adornment should be on good works, and on the hidden person rather on than on externals of clothing and hair and jewelry. Neither is there any reason to nullify the general command to be modest and sensible or the warning against ostentation. The only question is whether wearing braids and gold and pearls is intrinsically sinful then and now. There is one clear indication from the context that this is not the point. Peter says, Let not yours be the external adorning of wearing clothes. The Greek does not say fine clothes, but wearing clothes, or as the NASB says, putting on dresses. Now we know Peter is not condemning is not condemning the use of clothes, he's condemning the misuse of clothes. This suggests then that the same thing would be said about gold and braids. The point is not to warn against something intrinsically evil, but to warn against its misuse as an expression of self-exaltation or worldly-mindedness. Add to this the commands concerning headship and submission are rooted in the created order, while the specific forms of modesty are not. This is why we plead innocent to the charge of selective literalism. I thought they were very good answers. 
I'm going to link to uh, a series we did. It's, it's one of three, so I'm going to put the first one in. Humpty Dumpty and Bible Interpretation. So at the end of each video, you'll see a picture link. You can press on that to get to the next Humpty Dumpty. Thanks.